Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the International uh, Peace Institute. I'm very impressed that uh, there are so many here so early in the morning. Um, like uh, many of you who are here and also in the panel, um, I, I do have experience from the field, uh, spending many, many years uh, in the Middle East on um, Israeli-Palestinian issues and regional issues and Lebanese issues in particular. And uh, also, <clears throat> I can see many faces who have experiences from uh, headquarters, as I also had for the last um, eight years. Um, uh, yesterday evening, we celebrated the reopening of uh, the United Nations Secu Security Council chamber. Uh, and um, uh, there was a little remark here that uh, uh, Norway seems to control everything here, the Security <laughs> Council and uh, IPI. Uh, but we will not say that we are sorry for being Norwegians uh, uh, this morning. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we all know well this morning's uh, topic, um, uh, which touches upon a core dilemma of multilateral di uh, diplomacy, namely how to bridge the gap between New York and the field. This headquarters field relationship can become a nagging distraction or even a deterrent to progress when it comes to peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peace building. It is not surprising that this dilemma, the gap between New York and the field, is challenging the peace building commission. The PBC is a relatively young intergovernmental advisory institution serving both the Security Council and the General Assembly. And luckily uh, for all of us, we have this morning with us um, a distinguished panel which has been assembled during the Norwegian Foreign Minister's visit here in New York to reopen the Council Chamber. And I do hope that the panelists will bring new ideas and creative thinking to address this dilemma. So, most welcome to, um, uh, to each and one of you. I will invite you to be provocative on the issue and to offer ways to improve the Peace Building Commission as a bridge for both the, the uh, Security Council and the General Assembly. And I do hope that this morning will present a great opportunity to reflect on the what and the how of the Peace Building Commission's role in mobilizing resources, fostering the alignment of international engagement, and, provide, um, and in providing uh, political and, I dare say, popular support to national peace building priorities. In order to um, have a substantive exchange and hopefully a lively discussion, uh, I'm now taking the opportunity to um, remind our panelists to keep their remarks to about seven to eight minutes. And I hope you all, panelists, can feel my stern look at you related to this time frame. Our first speaker is my very good friend, the Foreign Minister of Norway. Uh, Aspen, um, Foreign Minister of Norway, has served in his current role since September 2012, and prior to that as Norway's Minister for Defense since November 2011. And I think you also had at least two stints as the State Secretary in the Foreign Ministry. Am I right? Yeah. So he has extensive experience in international and security affairs, both as a, uh, as a practitioner and from earlier work as um, a political science researcher. Um, over the last two decades, he also has had several assignments uh, for the UN, including responsibility for directing the uh, policy review on integrated missions, uh, which is very, very relevant to what the Peace Building Commission is all about, and in 2004, in 2004 and also as an expert advisor on a high-level um, panel on UN reform, which completed its work in 2005. So Aspen has uh, intimate uh, and uh, in-depth knowledge of what the UN is all about, and in particular, the relationship between um, uh, UN headquarters here in New York and the field. So Aspen, with these uh, words, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tadia. It's, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Tadia. It's uh, very good to be 
here at, uh, at this uh, great institute again and with this uh, very distinguished panel and also to engage in a dialogue on a topic that has been very close to my heart for actually four decades. Uh, the UN or the international community has been uh, dealing with, in, in different wording, different names and different concepts, we have been dealing with the issue of how can we assist in transitions from war to peace or transitions from chaos to order or transition from the absence of democracy to more democratic institutions. Uh, you name it like you want to, but since the, at least since the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and throughout that time, there has been a lot of work trying to figure out how can we get better at it. And I want to say, since uh, we will all be probably quite critical, I will begin to say that we are far better at it now than we were 20 years ago. And I've been engaged in this for, for throughout this period. Uh, I, I would add to your list that in the early 90s, I was also engaged in, in the DPKO, what was then known as the Lessons Learned Advisory Board. Uh, and there was a, a Lessons Learned Unit, which is now Best Practices, but uh, which came out of DPKO, uh, where very, you know, initially, even when, you know, before uh, Srebrenica and before sort of the crisis of the mid-90s, there was a, sig a si very serious effort by the UN Secretariat in, in the early Kofi Annan days to actually, you know, put this on the table. How can we get better? What can we do? And I think we have gained some knowledge about it. And of course, one of the big issues, as you, as you um, refer to, is the, uh, uh, is the question of the field versus headquarters. Uh, but even before we can significantly or seriously engage in field versus headquarters, we have to also to understand relations between uh, the international community as such, mm -hmm. represented in the field, uh, and the affected communities, so the, the countries, the states, the people that we're trying to help and to serve, and to understand the political relationship between their transition and our ability to uh, to affect that transition. I think one of the reasons that we become smarter, somewhat smarter, uh, maybe not very smart, but better than we were, uh, is that we have the understanding of the complex nature of transition is, you know, is the, the, under, is the understanding is at least better. That these are truly political endeavors. They are very complex. It's about um, establishing a new or re-establishing uh, broad social compromises between different parts of society. It's about uh, mm -hmm. creating um, uh, state capacity, you know, the, institute, the, the capacity of deliverance of health and education and security and so on. Uh, and it's also about creating institutions that, uh, that uh, reflects the political compromises and the compromise building culture or the political culture. That's what we're trying to affect. And what we've seen now for a long, for many, a long time, whole, all back since we started to talk about delivering as one and one UN and all this, uh, it is that we need to try to assist that through a better understanding of the strategic priorities, that we cannot do everything. We have to make certain choices. Uh, and, and also what I have described in, uh, also in writing many years ago, the, what we can talk about as the paradox of intervention, which is that we're intervening, and I'm not here talking about military intervention as, you know, going in and doing something which is not welcome, but I'm talking about, you know, having a lot of people, a lot of money, a lot of engagement in other people's country is an exception to the rule. It's not normal. And the purple, purpose of that exception is to create normalcy. We're trying to, to change something from disorder to order uh, through a rather paradoxical thing, namely that we go in and try to help. And to understand all that, I think we've got, become better at it. And then we come to the work that we did in the early, uh, early years of this uh, uh, century, uh, uh, prior to 2005, the work on integrated missions. Uh, I think the, the, the integrated missions, which is still you know, disputed, uh, at least is a good answer to a good question, at least it's an, an answer to a good question, namely how can we join up the international community's efforts so that, uh, so that we can subsume the different uh, capacities that we bring to the table in such a way that they have a strategic, they are, you know, they are sort of organized through some kind of strategic framework where priorities are made. Uh, as soon as that was discovered, it became clear that there is a limit to how integrated you can be in the field if you do not have headquarters support. And that many of the limitations were not only in the field, uh, but at headquarters. Mm -hmm. So there was a strong need to create institutions, but also institutional culture, 
uh, at the New York level, including both Secretariat and, uh, and member states that were able and willing to say that we really engage in this particular issue, which could be the political transformation of a certain country that have come out of a peacekeeping operation. The war as such uh, is over, but we're, we're, we're embarking on a long-term post-conflict uh, peace-building uh, endeavor. Um, and, uh, and, and the peace-building commission, as well as the peace-building support office, of course, are children of that thinking and came out of 2005. And I, I remain convinced that they were, again, they were answers to a very pertinent question. And the question is, how do we, A, make sure that we stay tuned, that we continue, uh, continue to engage long after the CNN has packed up their camera lights and moved somewhere else, that we have a continued long-term engagement? Because after all, in the 90s we saw, and, and the early... Uh, uh, 21st century, we saw a number of conflicts which we thought we had solved, but then relapsed into conflict because the, uh, you know, the short-term presence of the peacekeeping kept the war away without really installing real peace. We left and conflict came back. Haiti, several times, for instance. So the need actually to stay engaged was one question. The other one was to re recognizing that we are not able to do everything that would be nice to do. How do we make certain strategic priorities? So that's the framework but within all these, these institutions were born. Uh, and that's the good news. Now the question is, and I will uh, I've soon use my seven minutes, so my question is rather, how good are we actually at doing it? Because, and, and here's my challenge, I wonder, and I, I put it as a question, I wonder whether we have to a certain extent created additional institutions that are you know, on top of all, what we already had, rather than actually uh, creating real institutions of integrating what was already there. Because the problem was not, at least what we found in the, the two studies that I was engaged in around 2005, that it was normally not the absence of resources, not really the absence of will, or political capital. It was that the, the resources and the will was distributed in so many directions that they didn't add up to real change. So are we, are we there? Well, maybe better than we were, but I think it's still serious work in progress. And it requires that the Secretariat is able to bring its own capacities together under a strategic framework that requires a strong engagement at the Sec Secretary General's level. It requires that we as member states and donors and particularly interested countries uh, are willing also to pool our resources and engage together and stay engaged over a long time. And it requires that we have a good understanding of what we can do and what we cannot do uh, when we engage with a, a state that's a, is, that is transitioning into, uh, into something that hasn't been before. So I'll, I'll open in that open framework and I'll come back with more. Um, thank you very much, Aspen, for sharing with us your extensive uh, knowledge of the um, issues at hand. I have a question for you, and actually also for the other panelists, but you can wait uh, and think before you answer it. Because, And my question is, is it always a good idea to have integrated missions? Isn't, isn't it so that in some places um, the peacekeeping arm of the UN is the worst enemy of the peacemaking arm of the UN, and vice versa? that um, when you have a peacekeeping operation, and I can give you some examples later, uh, in the field, if you reopen the root causes of the conflict, then you put the peacekeepers in peril. And, um, uh, uh, and uh, that the, uh, the uh, peacekeeping arm of the UN is basically telling the peacemaking and peace building, hold your, uh, your uh, arms, metaphorically, uh, because if you now drill into the political issues, you are putting us at, uh, at peril. So I will just uh, let that linger, uh, and then I will um, uh, ask, our, <laughs> ask, our, <laughs> ask our next uh, speaker, uh, Judy Cheng Hopkins, uh, who is the Assistant Secretary General, as we all know, for the uh, Peace Building Support um, uh, Office. And Judy, I remember very well, I think it must be seven, eight years ago, yeah. when we yes. met the first uh, time, we were incidentally put at the back seat of a car for several hours crisscrossing the English uh, countryside. Yeah. And we had a very, this was long before you started in the <laughs> right, Peace Building right. Commission. And we have a and very- I will not repeat the things she told me. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, I will not repeat what she told me. No. <laughs> Well, anyhow, uh, uh, Judy um, has had a long and successful UN career, spanning over, actually, believe it or not, 30 years. 35. Covering 35, 35. is it? Um, 
covering development and humanitarian work, uh, with also, uh, I believe, a 10 year stint in, um, in Africa. Um, so it is a real pleasure, Judy, after these uh, six, seven years, uh, to, uh, to, to have you on a panel here at IPI to uh, listen to uh, your views. Um, Judy also served as the UN Assistant High Commissioner for Refugees from 2006 and 2009, and previously as the Director of the World Food Programs Asia and Eastern Europe Bureau from 1997 to the year 2000. So, Judy, we are very much looking forward to your remarks. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Terry, and nice to see you again after seven years. <clears throat> um, yeah, before I start, I really uh, want to show the appreciation of the Peace Building Support Office and the whole Peace Building architecture to Minister Aide for, for really initiating this this, which I hope is the first of several processes to come as we reach the moment of truth, mm. which is 2015, as you all know, which is when the whole peace building architecture will be evaluated. Um, and I think it's really the right way to, to go about it, even now, to start the processes before we get to 2015. <clears throat> I know I only have eight minutes, Terry, and I'm gonna try and stick to it, but I, I wanna say right off that, uh, because I don't wanna be misunderstood, there are many things that have happened, many uh, really very positive things that have happened with PPC engagement. Uh, but if I were to sit here and, and, and just praise it, my, my eight minutes would be over. Uh, so, but I don't want to be misunderstood. So I'm going to be focusing on the problems and the challenges. Uh, because the whole idea of this seminar uh, or this kind of, uh, is to find solutions, is to start uh, looking at the problems, finding solutions. So I just want to say that from a start. Um, so since we only have eight minutes and it's such a complex issue, I thought the best way to focus my time is to define the problems. If I can give you a, a clear enough definition of the problem, the way I see it, after talking to so many of you, then maybe we're closer to finding a solution. If we are not clear on defining the problem or we have completely at odds uh, views of defining the problem, we'll never ever come to a solution. So if you don't mind, uh, I, I would rather focus on that and then in the end point towards maybe a new model. So definition of problem, if I can come straight to the point. One of the major problems, story of our lives, is that um, you know, the founding resolution setting up this new architecture was, was, was vague. Um, a lot of resolutions are vague, it's not, it's, it's not nothing new, but unfortunately when it, it, you know, it leads to, the, uh, to, to implementation of new mechanisms and you're vague, then there could be some problems. And if I can just zoom in on two, two immediate ones. Then there are other problems as well, but let me zoom, zoom in on two. One is uh, the, the lack of clarity of, of the context. The, the founding resolution never contextualized the, um, what the UN already has in the field, i.e. political missions and peacekeeping missions, and how the Peace Building Commission would interact uh, and situate itself within, uh, within these, mission, these missions. Mm. And if one wanted to really get to the point, get to the bottom line, is in fact, uh, a lot of it is actually the relationship between what the PBC chair does and what an SRSG in the field does. Mm. So, so in the end, it comes down to that. So you can imagine then um, in the early days of the uh, peace building architecture, less, a lot less today, in fact, you know, a lot, lot less. In the early days, there were lots and lots of tensions when the PBC chair would land in, in the country office, meet with the SRSG. You can imagine the conversation, right? Be because of the lack of clarity of what each one does. Each one thinking that, you know, that, um, that they, you know, they, they know better than the other. Um, so um, so from before my time, but I heard horrendous stories about back then. Um, the second um, vagueness is the link to Security Council. General Assembly as well, but Security Council more so. Um, you know, in the, when, when I speak to some old timers, they tell me that the whole idea was this was meant to be a, an advisory, you know, almost like a delegated entity from the Security Council, which had to uh, deal with such, you know, the Syrias and the Malis of this world and, and, and have the sort of more simmering conflicts dealt with by the PBC and reporting back to it. Um, 
it's not so uh, at best. It's a very formalistic once or twice a year briefing to the Security Council at the same time when the SRSGs do their briefing. Is that the extent of it? Is that, is that the extent of the uh, advisory role to Security Council? Um, so it's floundering, if I can be very frank there, it's floundering because the Security Council says, show me your value added. What can you tell me more than what the SRSG tells me? When you show me your value added, then maybe I'm in a more of a position to seek your advice and your advisory role. And the PBC would say, but then precisely what then would you want advice in so that we can focus our, so it's, it's a circular problem. It keeps, you know, it's, you know, ever since I've been here three years, you know, so much of my life is dealing with circular problems. You know, you, no, you first, you first. Um, and same thing with, uh, with relationship with the SRSGs. Uh, a lot of times, um, if, especially if the personalities don't match, then you have the same phenomenon of circular. Show me your value added and, and it goes on from there. So, um, and, and the point is there's no link to the Security Council. If we don't get that right, then, then you know, as they say in America, where's the beef? Where's the beef? The whole idea is to link it to the ultimate peace and security arm uh, of the system. And if there's no link, then it's just floundering out here in the, on the side somewhere. You know, going where, we don't know. So I think, um, second problem, uh, I would say right off, too large to succeed. Too large to be strategic. When you have um, a lack of clarity as to what, you know, what it does, uh, what, what the PPC does, you know, as, you, as they say, form follows substance. But if the substance is not clear, then form takes on a life of its own. Form then, I'm sorry to say, again, sorry for being so blunt, in the UN then, then we're very comfortable with certain forms here. Yeah. Fifth committee, six committees, seven committees, all the committees. So, and some people have said that the PBC is almost functioning like one of these committees, i.e. large, you know, 31 members, 34, 33 members, uh, very formal speeches one after the other. Um, uh, and, and even though the discussions, I'm, I must say, some of the discussions are very interesting, but where is it feeding to? Where is it leading to? What's the outcome? What's the utility of it? Besides just having a, a nice day and a nice conversation in a room somewhere, um, I, th I think that's, that's the point. How can, we be more how can the, these discussions be more strategic? So as I said, so we have today, you know, these um, a relatively large, unwieldy 31 member, um, um, you know, fora, uh, headquarters centered, and, and, um, and the structures are, are formal, um, and, and maybe, as I said, uh, too big to, to have um, strategic dialogues. Um, so then, many feel that the structure, many feel, even though I say, as I keep saying, there are many positives that many have recognized and pointed out, but many feel then that the structure has lost its relevance to the field. And, um, and I, I can openly quote her because she's very outspoken on that, Ellen Margreta Loy, who was both a founding ambassador as well as an SRSG, um, says you know, very clearly that that was not the intention from day one in 2005, mm -hmm. to have this you know, mammoth structures here in, in headquarters, you know, having talking shops, so to speak, uh, as opposed to something a lot more nimble and, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, strategic and focused in field problems. Our raison d'etre, all of us, our raison d'etre, if you can put it in three words, is to prevent relapse of conflict. You know, is prevent relapse. And so, so the focus should be actually crystal clear that that's what we should be doing. Um, so, so then, obviously, the solution has to be around uh, focusing on this relapse issue, you know, having clearer division of labor amongst the, the, um, the, 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 the group. Um, maybe I, I should add that um, in one or two cases of these country configurations, the chairs actually formed smaller steering groups. So while you, ha you had the larger uh, country configuration and the OC and all that, they had seven or eight members of a steering group. Because I think here, let's be very frank, we have to, to do some kind of stakeholder analysis. You know, who has interest that the peace in this country is kept? Who has the interest? Stakeholders. How do you define them? Maybe neighboring countries because of the spillover effect. Neighboring countries. Maybe the largest donors to that country because they don't want their investments and in aid after all these years to go up in smoke. Maybe it's traditional allies, some groupings that they belong to together, traditional allies. So surely if one wanted to focus on stakeholders for that particular country, one would start that way. And then one would have the smaller steering group 
dealing with these problems, but, but to be inclusive, because that's the beauty of this architecture, because it does include so many other uh, segments, um, then the, the country configurations and the OC, for instance, could meet uh, maybe, maybe even twice a year to have the larger tent to talk about much more general issues than these very um, detailed strategic ones that are very focused uh, and, very importantly, closely coordinated with the SRSGs. I think we have to be so clear that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But also the, that your country, the member state, uh, the country behind the, the, of, of which the chair belongs, is also strongly behind uh, behind this uh, what, what the chairs or the members of the strategic group or, or the steering group are doing. So in other words, we, we don't want field-based country configurations. Some have mentioned that maybe in the question here you have, that maybe we should have field, but I don't think so because we are duplicating structures already there. That's precisely what both of you have said. You know, uh, there's, there are coordination mechanisms, sometimes even too many. We have SRGs coordinating, RCs coordinating, something even amongst the donors themselves, they have coordination. The World Bank coordinates around certain issues as well. So I, I don't think we want to have a field-based CSE. We want to focus on the, the comparative advantage of this intergovernmental body, which is the fact that it's situated in New York. It has proximity to Security Council. If only we can perfect that relationship. Uh, it has the larger member states, uh, 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 all folk, all here, based here, for which they can draw on support. So, um, so um, j again, very quickly then, let me come to a, a hypothetical case, a Central African Republic. You know, during the crisis, the, the SRSG, as you know, Margaret Vaught is, is doing a great job, but she's putting out fires. She's literally putting out fires, evacuating people. She's dealing, running around and all that. So I would imagine that, uh, and, and then while the council also took his eye off the ball, the council was not exactly focused on car, because at that same time was Syria and Mali and all that. So one could imagine hypothetically that a, a chair at that particular moment could have, the play, could have played the role of of supporting and working with the SRSG while he or she was busy, as I say, putting out fires, in being the bridge to the Security Council, you know, advocating for the country and and uh, and, and 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 pushing for for the for for the council to even focus for a moment on that particular country, you know, maybe it could also draw the donors together. Should donors then continue doing business as usual with with uh, with a with a non-constitutional uh, power uh, in place? Um, so what should the donors be doing? So uh, also the neighbors, the Chads, the Gabons, you know, neighboring countries, should not there be not outreach to these countries, uh, again, to support the SRSG uh, in this endeavor? So, you know, in a way to play a good cop, bad cop role, maybe certain messages at this particular time cannot be delivered by the SRSG. So be the bad cop, be, be, the, be the troubleshooter, if you wish, be the matchmaker, if you wish, call it whatever you want, but be that bridge. And, and, and basically back the SRSG's political efforts in that right way. So, so for, to do that, obviously, we do need political entrepreneurship. I call it political entrepreneurship because it's taking risks and, uh, and, and looking for your opportunities and using them. Um, so so um, I'm not going to sit here and say then what the new model is, but obviously, it, once we've defined the problems, then, then the solution has to be the other side of the coin. If you say it's too big to be strategic, then obviously we have to look for another, another model, something smaller, something more nimble, and something, as I say, that really focuses on stakeholders, not just anybody who happens to walk into the room, but the real stakeholders. Um, and then, um, uh, I know my time is up. Uh, as I said earlier also, keeping, keeping, but also maintaining the, the inclusiveness, uh, which has won um, this, this architecture so much um, you know, popularity with, with many of the other membership that, that don't get a chance maybe to deal with these issues in other fora in the UN. Um, then once we're able to, 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 to come towards this model after looking at all these problems and what the solution could be, then maybe we'll come closer to having, you know, to define that value added that, that we, keep, we keep looking for, that value added, so that others are a lot more skeptical. And we actually, you know, play on comparative, the concept of comparative advantages. To, as I said, the, the worst thing is to duplicate the PBC in the field, because that's exactly the opposite of working on comparative advantage. You're crowding the field. You're crowding the field already with structures there to do it. Um, so building on comparative advantages, and um, so basically, uh, I I'm giving you the broad strokes on the canvas, but I want to make it very clear that we need you to help us to help you. 
because it was your decision, it was your resolution to set up this architecture. It was you, member states, to set it up. So basically, I need, we need you to help us, then to help you to make this work. Um, you know, I, this, I had no stake in this architecture. I was happily in uh, Geneva at that time, uh, or riding across the English countryside with Terry. Uh, so, so please, we need you then um, to, to give your views, very frank views, on how we can correct this machinery and make it work right, because everybody knows that the potential is there, it's, it's, it's out there. And, and I hope that this, this process, as I said, is a complicated topic, that this is only the first step, step in the process. I really hope, uh, Minister Aide, that, that you know, since we've done so well with Norway on this, that we could have maybe one or two more steps thereafter. Uh, for instance, um, we, you know, this kind of a thing, maybe it's good to have a workshop format, because then you could have small groups grappling with the three or four problems we've outlined. So we have some kind of participatory approach to how uh, we deal with, with this problem once we have agreed on defining what the problem is. Um, then, um, and then at the end of the day, if I can look far ahead, of course the onus then is on us, uh, PBSO, after all this activity has taken place, to come up with some kind of a guidance note on under various scenarios what the models could be. There's no one size fits all, but once we have done all this consultation and we've had you know, good brainstormings and whatnot, then I think the onus is for us. We can't go on talking forever and have nothing in, in some written form in terms of guidance notes of, of where we're going with this. And this is way before the 2015 review. I think, I think the pressure is, I feel the pressure very strongly on us to be grappling with this issue. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much, Judy, and my memory, I must say, again, drifts back to that car ride, because what I notice is that you are speaking with the same incredible, um, candid style, not only privately, but also publicly. Uh, and I think we all highly uh, appreciate it, and, uh, and also, uh, Judy, for, for speaking with such incredible clarity uh, as you did. And I, I will actually encourage you all to um, uh, particularly comment on what Judy was saying about the challenges of the relationship um, to the field, uh, to the SRSDs, uh, and also the relationship between the PBC and uh, the Security Council. But now it is um, my pleasure to welcome uh, Ambassador uh, Ranko Vilovic, who is the permanent representative of um, Croatia and the uh, chairperson of the Peacebuilding Commission. Um, Ranko um, assumed the role of chair of the Peacebuilding Commission this past January. He has worked extensively in multilateral diplomacy, both here in New York and in wonderful um, Vienna. I'm saying this because we have the director of our Vienna office uh, uh, present here. As well as the um, as a extensive experience in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Croatia and in bilateral postings. Um, Ranko, on assuming the um, role uh, of the chair of the Peacebuilding Commission, you urge members, um, as far as I've uh, researched, to put our heads together on ways to reinforce the body's founding vision. So we are very pleased that you could um, join us here today. And Ranko, now the microphone is yours. Good morning, and thank you for this introduction. Uh, First of all, my gratitude and appreciation to the government of Norway uh, and to the minister himself for being here and co-organizing it and appreciation to the IPI for co-organization. Uh, special thanks also to Judy Cheng Hopkins for uh, having her fingers in today's event, but also for all the support and uh, everything that uh, PBSO is doing for the uh, PBC uh, endeavors in general. Although not uh, having uh, personal experience uh, in uh, driving with Judy through the English countryside, uh, she basically encompassed a lot of things that I wanted to say, so this will be a kind of uh, follow-up to, to where she stopped uh, partially during to time constraints. Now, uh, what we all are aware is that the uh, mandate foreseen in 2005 was vague, and it was vague on purpose. It was time of uh, optimism. It was time of 60th anniversary and all these big uh, projects that we witnessed. Uh, some of the, you in person, some of them uh, uh, from afar. But um, 
It, it caused the lack of clarity. Yes, that is the truth. We want to see how in practice we can fill this gap and how we can uh, focus on our impact on the ground. It is true that we are, as PBC, Newark-based organization. We all know what it means, and we know, all know that uh, without impact on the ground, it will remain Newark-based, and uh, that the result, when we measure it at the end of the day, will be limited. Now, uh, how can we fill the gap between New York and the ground? It is not only the question for the Peace Building Commission, it is the question for all entities within UN system, uh, in the peace building, in the peacekeeping, and beyond, in the developmental security and other areas. So we are not the exception. I would uh, uh, rather say that we are kind of a rule in that respect. We all know that in 2005 there were high expectations, and you know, uh, whenever you have high expectations, some things come true, some things do not. Now, after seven years, eight years, we are close to the situation, close to the uh, moment where we can assess how much did we achieve, where are the gaps, where are the loopholes, and uh, how we can uh, proceed. Now. Uh, Reality was, of course, a little bit different. Uh, PBC uh, organizational committee membership is uh, uh, active, but very often it is limited not only to several countries uh, that have certain interests uh, that are active in the in the work of the organizational committee, but basically it is uh, uh, about those countries which were generous enough to, to render their uh, offices uh, as uh, chairs of uh, country-specific configurations. And that's the most concrete and the most effective uh, part of the work of the PBC. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate the role of a support office. And uh, of course, uh, we didn't mention today, but we all have it on mind, uh, Peace Building Fund. Uh, in fact, there, there are two parallel tracks, and it was mentioned, and uh, I hope that in the discussion it will be stressed as well. Uh, being New York-based and field-oriented. Uh, of course, one of the key elements, uh, as mentioned already, is the relationship between PBC as such and uh, uh, SRSGs on the ground. We did have uh, wonderful examples of coordination and working together. We did have uh, not so brilliant examples. Now, uh, can we leave it only to the personalities? Uh, we cannot avoid it, of course. The personality itself, himself, herself, means very much. But uh, the need to, to coordinate and structure uh, is obviously there. Now. Uh, what can be added value of, of the PBC? Since we are New York based, Judy said we are close to uh, key stakeholders. We are close to, to, to uh, Security Council, to General Assembly. We are close to all these structures that are New York based as well. Uh, what we can offer as a kind of uh, added value is developing from here, from New York, most more robust partnership with uh, non-UN operational actors, international financial institutions first and foremost, regional organizations, private sector. We will have a, a, a big meeting, a big event uh, end of June in that respect. Foundations and civil society. Our role is uh, advisory role and coordinative role. So uh, that's where we should focus. Uh, what we can do is sustain attention, resource mobilization, and improving coordination. Uh, now, concerning uh, the, the uh, input from individual states, yes, there are stakeholders, there are states that do have interest, they do have direct interest belonging to the region, being neighbors or being major donors that do have indirect interest for uh, political or uh, human humanitarian or any other reasons. And we 
should uh, be more active in coordinating all those efforts. That's the task of the Peace Building Commission. Uh, what we can improve still is uh, the relationship between uh, PBC and uh, UN governing bodies. We do have uh, uh, initiatives, not only formally to report to General Assembly and Security Council, but really to try to have more interactive dialogue. Uh, on the 26th of April, we will have the interactive dialogue in the Security Council. And I think that the outcome of that dialogue may give us some guidance where we can go, uh, in which direction we can, we can go in the future. So, uh, we try, and it is, uh, I, I noticed in IPI's uh, preparatory papers, it was also mentioned, we are trying to intensify also the contacts uh, between the PBC, again, New York-based, and uh, uh, SRSGs. Last year we did have a meeting. Uh, this year we did have a video conference. We will be trying to, to, to uh, uh, intensify and to see where we can really uh, have a synergy and not a competition. I would limit my, my remarks respecting seven, eight minute limits, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and um, thank you again for speaking with such uh, clarity and being um, so candid. And I think you actually went straight into the core issue, and I think you will have the opportunity to comment on it uh, afterwards. Uh, namely, is there an added value? Um, and if so, I think uh, you gave um, uh, answers to, um, uh, to that question uh, seen from your uh, vantage point. And I hope that this might be the core of our discussion um, afterwards. So thank you very much again. And it is now my pleasure to introduce um, Marjun Kamara, who is the permanent representative of, of Liberia here at the UN. Uh, Marjan brings more than 25 years of experience working with the United Nations in the area of humanitarian affairs uh, while she was the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. You worked in the field and at headquarters, thus you have, experience, um, have experienced the field um, headquarters linkage firsthand. We value, as well, your contribution to the uh, discussion from the perspective of a country which is on the agenda of the Peacebuilding Commission. And I am looking very much forward, and I know all of you are joining me, in hearing your perspective today based on these dual uh, experiences. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I want to join previous speakers in thanking the government uh, of Norway and thanking you, Mr. Minister, for being with us today. We're thanking the, the IPI for organizing this, another very good uh, opportunity to exchange views on something that is very uh, important. And of course, uh, to extend appreciation to Judy and the staff of her office for their contributions to this and for the steadfast uh, support that they continue to provide us. Well, I will start, I know a lot has been said about the Peace, Peace Building Commission here and uh, the vague terms of reference and everything, so I will not focus so much on that, especially since I have only uh, seven minutes, I want to talk more about uh, obviously what is happening in the field and how I think that, that actually the Peace Building a dimension can, could be strengthened at the field level where it matters. Uh, so I start by making the first point that international organizations that locate the headquarters so far from the operational basis are continuously engaged in this issue of gap bridging. And uh, we know that from our experience uh, in, in, in working with UN agencies, myself, UNHCR is in Geneva and we had multitude of field offices which the PBC doesn't have on the ground and we were constantly preoccupied with the issue of gaps. And, and usually these issues came up in the context of, of sharing information, in the context of understanding what's happening really in the field and what's underpinning the decisions that are coming from the field and reporting. So I see the UN 
agencies are no different. You know, uh, the UN entities are no different. So it is appropriate uh, that the New York-based, New York-centered uh, PBC should be examining the gaps. And I think this is, this is normal and it should be done at regular intervals, in fact, with the aims of achieving greater efficiency and, sh and sharpening the focus of the mission and reaching higher levels of fulfillment of the, of, the, of the mandate. Let me say as a second point that we believe, and I focused on the, the issue of the interface mechanism because it was there, so I went through, I went through uh, that door in a big way. I've had to cut down a lot uh, of what I said, but I, we believe, uh, uh, that an interface uh, mechanism is important and necessary uh, for the PBC to maximize its intervention in the field and achieve uh, the objectives of supporting countries on the agenda. Uh, this mechanism, we believe, could strengthen the PBC's capability to carry out some of its core responsibilities of advocacy, mobilization, and coordination on the ground. And the critical challenge, though, is what form this mechanism should take, obviously. So the ultimate decision, uh, we will agree, should be determined by the circumstances uh, of each country. As Judy said, a one-size approach is not advisable. So the experience of Liberia suggests that some kind of field-based mechanism could bring uh, added value to the, to the interventions of the PBC. In Liberia, we have a joint steering committee, we call the JSC, which currently serves as a link between Monrovia and New York consistently coordinating the peace building processes on the ground, uh, meaning the peace building interventions on the ground, is co-chaired by government at the ministerial level and the deputy special representative of the Secretary General uh, and of, of ONMIL, and it comprises sen uh, senior government and UN officials and other stakeholders, that means NGOs and whatnot. And the JSC routinely reports to the PBC through the country-specific confederation, Mr. Uh, uh, Tillinder, who is the chair, is sitting here, uh, usually through video conferences and, uh, and uh, reports that are, that are uh, vetted in, in, uh, with everybody present, including the reporting on the statement of, of mutual commitment, where are we in implementation and so forth. And these VTC facilities, also enable us to exchange views with the SRSG and some uh, members of her staff when we need to do so. Uh, the JSC remains a relatively effective tool for coordination, for transparent and collaborative decision making and monitoring progress in program implementation. Notwithstanding the success that we've achieved with this, there are limitations because the JSC's focus is primarily technical and programmatic. You know, and we agree that there are other kinds of interventions that one can do. Similarly, the government managed uh, peace building office, which we have uh, in Morovia, it serves as a secretariat of the GSC. So it's also limited in the function and the scope. So with no administrative uh, structures on the crown, the PBC has really no mechanism for direct participation or presence in the activities that it is sponsoring itself. Uh, on a sustained basis. And why am I mentioning this? Because I'm coming also from the background of working with UNHCR, where we work through NGO partners. So we gave the funding to the NGO partners. They were engaged in the delivery of, of assistance on the ground. And when anybody came to talk to the refugees and say, where is your assistance coming from? Of course, they gave everything to the, to the NGO partners. So where is the real PBC and the peace building? component of this whole uh, arrangement. So beyond the, 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 the VCTs, the PBC's presence is through the visits, periodic visits that the chair of the configuration and his member states make, the ASG and the P PBSO and, the P and representatives of the Peace Building Fund. Otherwise, for representation on the ground, the PBC relies on the structures of ONMIL. And you know, the ONMIL has multiple structures, but ONMIL is essentially a peace keeping military operation. So peacekeeping and peace building have coexisted in Liberia for a number of years. So they are viewed by many as interchangeable UN processes. What's the difference? Well, the distinct differences in mandates and focus do not register indelibly in the minds even of some government officials, I have to, to, to admit. And when it comes to the average Liberian, there's no difference with all the same. So peacekeep, the peacekeeping, for obvious reasons, has been the dominant of the two uh, processes. So 
I'm thinking now that on mill is in transition, it may be timely and prudent to consider how to reinforce the peace building dimension of footprint uh, on the ground. Now, in, in a crowded field of bilateral, multilateral, non-state actors, there's so much that is happening in Monrovia. You know, uh, some kind of more pronounced presence, I believe, of peace building may be ideal. Now, I realize that funding and other kinds of considerations constitute major constraints. Nevertheless, I make the point that that presence could strengthen and give greater visibility to the peace building dimension of the UN's work and sharpen the focus on peace building consolidation priorities. I think it's a critical juncture at this point as we're talking about, about a transition. Also, there's a mindset of the people focused on peacekeeping and peacekeeping, and we can help them to transition in their minds by giving greater focus to uh, this peace building dimension. Uh, a field-based peace building mechanism would not uh, interfere, I believe, with the responsibility of the SRSG to provide overall leadership guidance and coordination for the entire UN system. Rather, I believe it would strengthen the emphasis on, on uh, peace building, and uh, that mechanism could serve as an important source of information to the office of the SRSG and to headquarters uh, on peace building. Certainly, of course, any kind of uh, standalone mechanism, whatever we want to do with it, the presence of PBC in a region holds good prospects uh, of, of uh, enhancing opportunities for direct participation in sub-regional meetings and for building enduring lines of collaboration on peace building with sub-regional entities such as the Minor River Union and ECOWAS. And a regional approach, a regional approach to peace building activities involving other neighboring countries could also be, be facilitated. Now, when you have these sub-regional meetings as we recently had one in Monrovia involving the Minor River con countries, that's Sierra Leone and Guinea and, uh, and Cote d'Ivoire, of course you would invite uh, Onimil, but I think as a separate thing, you could invite a, some entity that's dealing with peace building as a spokesperson. And I don't want to undermine the, the role of the SRSG and a very important contribution that SRSGs, well, our SRSG, I don't know about personalities in other places, but that our SRSGs uh, SRSG is making, but SRSGs talk about everything. They talk about the military, they talk about everything. And yes, in the concept of, of delivering as one, they can talk about peace building. But I think that we want to highlight peace building because of the important role that it has. It is to help a relapse of conflict. So all of the risks and all of the priorities that PBC is working on, which has, have been jointly identified by our country, need to continuously be put on the radar screen. And I'm not sure that one person who has that overall responsibility of talking about everything maybe that the UN does will do that. And whether that one person's role could not be really enhanced on this particular area, which is, is uh, so, so critical. So while we believe that a standing field-based PBC mechanism would be useful in any circumstance, because presence presence has inherent benefits. We, we, we would emphasize that it needs to be studied in the case of individual countries. We need to look at pros and cons. If uh, some of the countries on the agenda of the PBC do not even have a JSC, then obviously we need to be looking at that. But in the, in the situation of Liberia, where we already have a JSC, how do we, if that is where we want to go, how do we reinforce, how do we strengthen the role of the GSC? How do we move it from just being a programmatic, uh, technical entity to something stronger that it can do, really some of the advocacy and, uh, and other kinds of responsibilities that the PBC has to do. And I must say that uh, you know, any effort to give meaning to this standing field mechanism that has been suggested, obviously has to take account of the imperatives. We're looking at lean structures, we're looking at avoiding duplication and overlaps, we're looking at making sure that the principle of, of delivering as one remains alive, uh, we're looking at minimizing bureaucracy, transaction costs, and all of these kinds of things. And so we need to consider this option of JSCs or how we can do something that can reinforce even more the peacemaking dimension 
of the work. Uh, let me say that, uh, that I think that there's obviously much room for creative thinking, and I will support the proposal which Judy has made of a kind of workshop that will keep us for more than the two hours this morning discussing all of the various uh, dimensions of this issue. Uh, on every occasion that I've come here, I have, uh, I have uh, learned, and I'm sure that this is not going to be an exception to that rule, that P IBR, I IPR enables us to really get our teeth into a lot of things, and it, all of the discussions that take place here actually enrich us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marjan. Well, I think on this occasion we have learned from you. Um, I think um, you were uh, terrific, um, uh, impressively, again, uh, candid and straight to the main points. Uh, now, in this um, uh, uh, range of um, uh, introductory um, interventions, uh, we will turn to a, a guy. And I can see my very able stuff has written something in my talking points here. It says, now we turn to the voice from the field on the panel. But actually, that's only the half truth, because um, Parfait uh, has been the uh, um, uh, chef de cabinet of both the um, president of the General Assembly back in 2004-2005, and he has also been the chef de cabinet of the deputy secretary general. So he actually has both extensive field experience and extensive experience um, here at headquarters. Uh, and as the uh, chef de cabinet of the um, uh, president of the general, uh, the general assembly at the time, uh, Jean Ping, uh, he also worked extensively on the um, World Summit in 2005 and knows the ins and outs of every single reform issue on the UN agenda. And of course, this was also the time when the peace building <coughs> commission was established. Uh, and, and Parfait, I cannot resist it. When you were chef de cabinet of um, uh, Jean Ping, you won, one day you called me. I was fairly brand new here. And you said, uh, Mr. Larson, can you invite the uh, president of the General Assembly and the P5 ambassadors for lunch tomorrow? And I was totally puzzled. So I said, why can't he invite the P5 for lunch himself? And then you said, Parfait, you see, he has to be totally accountable and transparent to all membership. But you are independent, so you can be totally uh, uh, intransparent and totally <laughs> unaccountable. And the day after, we had that lunch. And the issue at hand was, the, 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 I did. <laughs> and, but the issue at hand, uh, I, I will remind you, was reform of the Security Council. And you wanted to find out if that was at all possible. And the conclusion was very simple. Yeah. It was yeah. impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so, Parfait, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Terrier. Um, thank you, dear friend. Um, it's really a pleasure uh, being um, here with you, uh, Mr. Minister. Thank you for your leadership in putting us together to exchange ideas on uh, such an important uh, topic. Um, I was hoping to hide somewhere, but I think now that you have said everything, I, I feel a, a sense of guilt for all the blames placed on a very, um, uh, let's say, uh, unclear resolution establishing the, um, the PBC. Uh, and Mr. Minister, thank you for providing that background <clears throat> going into the, the creation of this uh, uh, important uh, mechanism. And uh, I, I can only say that I feel some comfort as I can share that blame with another witness here, uh, my dear friend Elizabeth, uh, uh, with whom we were at that time in the trenches trying to get the uh, outcome document for the 2005 uh, World Summit um, out. And then later on, um, uh, I, I was hoping that uh, the, the DSG would find time to come over here because he, he was the one actually who pulled that resolution together and did it with such uh, uh, brilliance, I must say. And it was at that time, I believe, the best deal we could get um, um, uh, to uh, uh, respond to this major <clears throat> gap that we were having uh, in the organization not knowing very much what to do, really, to uh, walk the, the, the path from um, recovery 
to um, a sustainable um, uh, uh, d development and, and peace. Um, then, because sometimes when we, uh, and, and sorry, Katarina, I, 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 I don't think I would be using our well-prepared statement. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, I think the conversation here has taken over, um, and, and we must just react to, to everything that has been said uh, so brilliantly uh, before us. Um, but let me just say one thing. As we <clears throat> spend time here, and I think it's, rightly, uh, as, uh, uh, to, to, it's right to do so, spend time to try to understand how we can be more effective by putting together the right structures. Uh, before coming um, this time to New York, I had the privilege of visiting um, uh, one of the projects funded by the PBF. Uh, there I met with uh, ordinary people, uh, ordinary Burundians, um, coping with their chattered you know, lives and trying to bring them all together, all these pieces together. And you cannot imagine uh, while we may be having uh, doubts and sometimes getting uh, um, some dose of cynicism and uh, are maybe being pessimistic about the whole setup. Um, what I want to bring here is um, just um, the testimony of people uh, in the field. What you do, what we do as a PBC, as a, as a PBC, as a as a PBSO, and uh, you yourself, Judy, you, 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 you've been with me, uh, I, I've been with you in, in the field, um, uh, visiting um, uh, some of those uh, fantastic projects uh, going on in Burundi. Um, these are life-changing um, mm -hmm. projects. They make such a big difference in the lives of these um, women uh, men, uh, former combatant, IDPs, returnees, um, those young girls and, and young boys uh, who have no other hope uh, but to look up to the, the UN and see what we can do uh, as a community of, uh, of nations and also as a group of um, uh, UN agencies working um, uh, on the ground. Uh, what we do in the field is extremely valuable. And I must say, Mr. Minister, now that the institutions are in place, um, uh, the next question is, um, um, are we putting enough resources into it? Uh, because um, in the case of Burundi, for example, um, a well-tailored project was aiming at 24 million sometime, um, around $24 million. Uh, they, they couldn't get those, those funds and ended up doing something with 10. And what I've seen, again, is just fantastic. Um, in the most, um, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the region that really uh, witnessed the most uh, awful um, 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 uh, impact of, of, of the conflict in Burundi, a youth center is being raised. And in, in that youth center, uh, Janine, one of the, the young girls, um, who is a member of that uh, um, uh, uh, small uh, steering committee to establish the, the, the center, came to me and, see, and said in, with um, a very uh, basic French, because of course, um, Kirundi is the only language they speak and they couldn't have opportunity to learn French because of the war, and was able to say um, very uh, moving uh, things um, to suggest that um, this is the place where they will learn to share ideas, learn to know each other, and learn to uh, defeat fear and, and build um, uh, lives um, on a sustainable basis, looking for a brighter future. So these are the things that I'm taking away from, from those encounters. And as, as um, um, in my uh, further conversations with colleagues, as some of them were growing a bit, um, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, worried and, and, and pessimistic about the kind of feedback they may receive from the political establishment, um, um, 
I, I, I invited them. I say, guys, um, you should take as part of your your regiment or your 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 uh, diet, so to say, in Burundi, uh, every other quarter a field trip. Go to the field and and get to to meet with the people. And I've uh, invited Paul uh, when he, he come um, he comes next time, um, and I hope he will be in June. That we will do that field that field trip together, um, and we will get to uh, to know and see the people. And this will be inspiring for to all of us, and give us um, a reason to believe that what we do here is meaningful. So um, the lesson. Uh, we have also seen in, um, in, in Burundi is that um, um, coordination um, between uh, UN agencies in the field um, is a reality. They share um, a common um, uh, uh, vision and uh, a common purpose as to why uh, we as a UN are there in the field. And to answer the question, Judy, you, you raised that is to um, ensure that through our support, countries uh, could be uh, spared for, from another uh, relapse into, into deadly conflict. So this work is taking place. And um, I must say, um, uh, and it goes sometimes beyond uh, what is being done within the PBC, but um, in the broader sense of delivering as one, um, um, uh, coordination is, um, is, a, is a key element of, of, of what we do. So I'm not really a big fan of, of structures uh, because I believe in people, uh, because I believe um, with the weakest structures, and by the way, you may never be able to fix it <laughs> so that you make it perfect and that um, um, it, it itself, you know, the structures itself will deliver the, uh, um, um, the uh, um, uh, projected objectives. I believe uh, women and men are committed, dedicated to the cause, and fully aware of what needs to be done uh, can make a tremendous difference and always um, uh, help raise the UN flag uh, the highest uh, uh, possible. Um, as we do that, um, we in Burundi, what I'm seeing in Burundi is uh, uh, once the, when the, the Burundi was put on the agenda of the, of the, of the, of the PBC, um, a strategic framework was established um, in the terms uh, that uh, my dear sister Majun was, uh, was, uh, was referring to. Um, a strategic framework exists in Burundi, and that strategic framework uh, is composed of one, a political um, um, kind of um, um, setup uh, led by the, 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 the two vice presidents of the country, alternatively, um, and involving um, all the key partners in the country, uh, being traditional uh, um, uh, partners or regional players. Um, neighboring countries, uh, they are all together in that in that mechanism, and and providing um, uh, political leadership, uh, which, by the way, needs to be nationally owned. And it's only if uh, national authorities are fully committed to the work of 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 uh, uh, peace building that really key uh, main result could be could be achieved. Uh, together with the the political. Um, Together with the political um, 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 setup, you have the um, uh, a strategic um, a framework, uh, which is uh, composed of partners only, working with the UN family, and providing te te technical uh, support and, 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 and backup to the to, to the uh, political framework. So that body exists. And from time to time, and this is what Paul is doing so well when he, he can visit um, uh, Bujumbura, he meets with that setup. And um, most uh, of it um, through direct contact with the leadership, including with the, uh, the, um, 
um, uh, international uh, key stakeholders in Burundi. And maybe we can do what the, the chair has just proposed, you know, to increase the number of VTCs where, you know, that national setup could be in, in uh, 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 sharing more information and, 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 uh, and, and dialogue with the PBC here uh, um, in, um, in, in New York to uh, attempt to bridge that gap. And of course, between uh, the SRSG and, and, uh, uh, um, and, and uh, the, the chair of the PBC, the country configuration, um, um, there must be uh, almost you know, regular daily or if not weekly briefings and, and exchanges. And this is what I've myself endeavored to do with Paul. And I, I must say that uh, as far as we are concerned, um, uh, we are not bogged down with those turf issues, which, by the way, is the, in the nature of any complex um, organization. But, uh, and, and, and in closing, um, um, Thierry, um, um, I, I must simply say, uh, and that I will borrow it to, uh, I will borrow it to, um, to my dear colleague, Katarina. I mean, um, um, I, I believe this is the three C's that we see as really the key to what we need to do. That is, again, coordination. Um, you need uh, a shared purpose and vision. And um, by all means, by all means, uh, we need to ensure that uh, we consult each other as we try to um, achieve the objective set uh, in, in our mandates, uh, both by the Security Council, but also by the PPC. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for so eloquently sharing with us views from both the field and from uh, headquarters. I think we have um, five interventions now, which uh, were all terrific, insightful, and very illuminating. Um, illuminating, actually, the achievements, the problems, and the challenges which are facing um, uh, uh, peace building and the instruments we have available. I will now uh, open, uh, open the floor. Um, uh, there are many main uh, issues which were touched upon by actually all of those who uh, uh, spoke in um, the panel. Uh, the uh, question I left lingering is uh, peacekeeping um, uh, or is, is um, uh, peacemaking the enemy of uh, peacekeeping in certain instances? Is uh, integrated missions everywhere a good idea, or maybe not? Uh, and also the relationship between um, uh, the Commission and uh, the Security Council and the field are, the, are, are broad questions which I would challenge you to, um, uh, not only to ask questions about, but also to comment on. But. I will ask you to keep your interventions for no more than one minute because time is running out. Um, maybe uh, <laughs> this is not for you. <laughs> they were just giving me a card here, which says. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, anyhow, um, so um, I would uh, then ask. Um, the participants in the hall to take the floor. I saw that you um, nodded very much when I, t I talked about uh, uh, integrated missions. Maybe uh, we should challenge you to, to, to give a couple of comments. Hello. Uh, Udo Jans from UNHCR here in New York. Uh, thank you, Terry. And indeed, I was nodding because I do share that skepticism, although uh, my office, at least, makes no bones about the fact that in most situations it is common sense, and that is perhaps the see I was waiting for from you, and thank you for that field perspective, if you like, that there is indeed a common sense of purpose, and I greatly believe that you're right in pointing that out. Not everything can be prescribed from headquarters, and hence delivering as one maybe a slogan that even the Millennium Hotel has now learned to put on their front door by changing their name, but it may not necessarily be the best mechanism to drive the point home on integrated missions as if it was the panacea for all situations. It is certainly not. And therefore, common sense and the common purpose that you outlined, Parfait, I think is what we are looking for. I thank you for the field perspectives, but also the candid uh, reviews on where we currently stand. I believe 
there is one gap in which we need to situate the entire, the entire debate, and that is the relief to development gap, out of which the Peace Building Commission was also born. And I believe that the architecture that was created, in fact, has helped greatly to bridge that gap. We should not forget that and see how through the mechanism that you, Marjan, outlined in Liberia as a concrete example, or from Parfait's uh, example, the steering committee, a light, nimble mechanism that can bridge the gap through increased communication, how we can move in that direction, because I think that gives us all the ingredients. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's been really like a comment on that. Yeah, quick comment. For, I mean, even when the concept of integrated missions were originally formulated, it was very clear, at least from those of us who wrote the initial report, precisely that integrated missions should not be a panacea. It could not be applied to everything. And even when you apply it, you need to make sure that form follows function, there's no fixed template, and you need to be adaptive. And I think one of the, and you, you have to change on the way, particularly if you succeed. Because if you succeed, it means you get something right. And then you have to change focus because you need to get something else right the next day, not just continue on the same, uh, on the same way, so to be adaptive. And then the problem, of course, is that uh, once that was said, then the council went out to you know, make a lot of resolutions where you actually did believe that there was a common template and you saw the same structures over and over again. And when Judy described the sense in the field when the when the PBC comes to see the SRSG, it sounded very much like the impression we had when, you know, back in the early, you know, back in 2004 and so on, even in places like Burundi or in Liberia, where the new SRSGs came to a place that used to be run by the country team. And you had the tension between the people who had been muddling through and learned how to live UNHCR, UNDP, <clears throat> a lot of people, and suddenly then there was somebody with an enhanced authority to who was there coming from somewhere else and suddenly knew how to do things. So, uh, so no sooner than actually the SRSG and the country team learn to you know, survive each other, then comes the PBS, uh, PBSC and do the same thing. So I mean, I, I have deep sympathy for the field level uh, perspective of that. At the same time, I think that everything we have learned points in the direction that the international community needs a joint up strategic approach. That does not mean a special model, but that we are able to prioritize. And I always, and every time people say coordination, I'm, I'm a little concerned because coordination, I've seen much coordination happen in the form of supply driven. I mean, people come to the table, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, you tell them I'm going to do, We're, we all agree we had a great meeting. Uh, what we need is not coordination, but strategic priori prioritization. Mm -hmm. The problem for even the world's best SRSGs is that they have the normative authority, but they don't actually have all the money because the money is IFIs, national donors, big funds and programs and agencies, NGOs, which of course again has national government money behind them. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's not going to change. We've been trying to change that for 20 years. It's not going to happen. That's, gonna, that, that's a reality of the international community. But we actually need to get everyone together to sit down and say, what is the particular emphasis? What is the center of gravity in this situation right now that we tr should try to join our forces to deal with uh, for, for, for at this moment? And then also have a, for, uh, a forum. And, and the good news about the invention of the PBC, despite its shortcomings, is that at least there is now a partner to talk to in New York, which wasn't there before. Because the previous problem was that if people in Burundi stopped killing each other, then the Security Council wasn't interested any longer until they started killing each other again. Uh, so the SRSG would not have anyone really to call, obviously somebody in DPKO and so on, but, or DPA. But, but, but now actually there is an intergovernmental body, which at least in principle is there to respond to continued needs. Right. And so rather than throwing it out, we have to get it better, more aligned, more coordinated. And, and its main role should be to support the field. Thank you very much, Espen. I will now quickly turn to uh, one of the architects be behind some of the structures here. Elizabeth, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks to IPI for um, hosting this meeting, um, and thanks to very esteemed panelists, starting with Minister Ida and everybody else. This was really tremendous, and I couldn't agree more that as we look to 2015, it will be important to have many of these kinds of fora for, for conversation. Um, first, I just wanted to say, Minister Ida, I couldn't agree more with your starting point that your diagnosis of the problems in 2004, 2005, 
remain valid today. We've made some improvements, but they're still very much the same challenges, and I would just highlight two of them. I think first is the issue you pointed to about the dispersal of effort, um, people trying to do too many things with the resources and political commitments they have. Um, the second is, I think, the issue of the tension, potentially, between different instruments of, uh, in particular, international assistance, and this goes to Teria's question about peacemaking and peacekeeping. I think from our perspective, the even greater challenge is between what the donors, the international financial institutions, and so on are doing, and the political and security uh, dimensions of support, um, and the need to um, find ways to bridge those remains uh, a continuing challenge. Um, second, I wanted to pick up on this issue of the vague mandate, um, and maybe this is to exonerate any of us in this room who had any sort of relationship to it. Um, it's true that a vague mandate um, creates challenges because you have to figure out how to interpret it, but it does give you a flexibility um, then, that you then need to figure out how to use. Um, there may be worse things than a vague mandate, which may be an overly precise mandate that limits your flexibility uh, and, and, uh, and is um, overly formal in the ways, Judy, that you describe uh, are a problem. Um, that leads me to my next point, which is that I think we can actually do a great deal more with what we have. And I would just pick up on this aspect of how the PBC relates to the Security Council. I think it's, we, we sometimes think of this as a, a question of how the PBC in its entirety moves into a chamber of 15 and speaks to a chamber of 15 in its entirety. Um, there are members of the Security Council that sit on the PBC, and to my mind, we have underused that uh, relationship to do more both in the PBC and in the Council. Um, and that's true for other um, um, parts of the membership of the PBC, the donors who are members, the conflict-affected countries who are members, and I think there's a lot of scope there to be much more uh, dynamic with those. And then just a last, um, Last point, we've been talking a lot about headquarters field gaps. Um, I, to my mind, there, that's almost less of a problem than the gaps at a headquarters level across institutions and the gaps at the field level across sort of implementers. Um, it's very clear to, to, to me that the real question of our success and the measure of our success is in the field, um, but then the PBC has a crucial role to play and often has played it but can still do more to play it to kind of be a platform to broker those gaps, both at the headquarters level and at the field level. Uh, my own view is that that doesn't mean becoming operational. I think that's a temptation that one ought to resist. It's much more of a strategic function, um, but, but very much an important one that we all need the PBC and the architecture writ large to play. So thank you very much for all of that. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Anybody in the panel who wants to comment on what Elizabeth said? at this stage, or we can come back to you uh, later. I saw a hand at the very back of the room. Can you please uh, uh, yes, um, na name and affiliation, please? Paul Mikov with Columbia University, until recently with World Vision International, an organization that deals with uh, these sort of uh, things. Um, I will be shielding a little bit behind uh, Judy's frankness, uh, because I'll be also frank. I mean, my observation is that the central problem of the PBC is the fact that it is too UN-ish and to UN-like. And if so, then the comment uh, that Ambassador Vilovich made is very much welcomed and very valid, and that is that uh, the PPC must begin much more intentionally and more robustly to be engaging, and I would say um, unapologetically rubbing shoulders with non-UN entities, foundations, civil society, uh, private sector uh, entities, et, uh, and so forth. It seems to me that the lack of linkage and perhaps insufficient uh, linkage with, with uh, those actors is a consequence, ironically, of the right or the correct rhetoric. What I mean by that is, ever, practically ever since the, uh, the day one of the establishment of the PBC, and certainly since 2006 when I started engaging uh, with it, the rhetoric has been, um, this is about the field, this is about what is happening where the rubber meets the road. This is about national players, national entities, national ownership, and all that. All correct rhetoric. However, it has resulted, in some ways, um, um, into an unnatural and very unhelpful dichotomy between national players and perceived international players. And so, I, as I said earlier, I was uh, part of World Vision International, a $2.6 billion organization, um, not unlike many other uh, similar international NGOs who have resources, infrastructure, 
capacities to deploy and deploy in many of these countries, actually many times over the UN as a whole. Uh, but it seems that the PBC has not been able to actually mobilize players like that that have a lot to bring to bear and are already present in these, uh, in these countries and in a very real sense have a national presence and a national ca character because 96 to 99 percent of the of the capacities or the, the 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 leaders are actually nationals rather than internationals um, and so it seems to me that there has been this is just one example uh, referencing the international NGOs uh, that have not actually been aligned to support and to advance the agenda and the priorities of the of the peace building commission in general and the country configurations in particular thank you Thank you very much. Uh, time has run out, and I will now go back to, to the panel for quick uh, co uh, concluding comments, and I will start with uh, you, Aspen. And, and uh, I'll start with the last question, because um, I think that's right. And to the, to the extent that is right, which I believe, uh, it, it means that the PBS, um, the, the Peace Building Commission, hasn't yet delivered on it, one of its main purposes, which was exactly to align all those resources which are not directly under the chain of command of neither the Security Council nor the Secretary General. Uh, and that we as uh, member states should make sure to be that link, you know, which, because there are, there are so many resources out there. And I think we have to be aware that they are not going to grow. They're going to go down. I mean, the, the traditional donors are now many of them, not, our, not us, but many others are now cutting because of uh, economic crisis at home. Some of the emerging powers, which are eventually giving more uh, aid, are, will do that through all the channels, I believe. So the traditional uh, sources are, will not be as much as they are. The, the answer to that is better prioritization, is that we're even better at making sure we do the right thing because we're not probably not going to do much more. And, and hence, you know, we need a framework in which to uh, say that once there is a mandate which has made certain priorities, how do you make sure that these components of the mandate is funded? This is one of the paradox of, I think, any modern Security Council mandate, that the Security Council can actually not control mm -hmm. that all these things happen because the money isn't there. Uh, the money may be there in the world, but it's not under the auspices of the UN Security Council. Well, it, it's still a good idea to have a broad mandate, but you have to line, link up even when the mandate is formulated with the institutions, agencies, funds and programs, IFIs, countries, who may be willing to fund so that you know that there is a relationship between ambition and resources. The worst mandates are when you have a very broad ambition and very li little ability to deliver. It's much better to be honest about having a relatively limited footprint and then actually deliver on the limited footprint, mm -hmm. or, uh, or vice versa, to have a broad ambition and be able to deliver on the broad, uh, uh, on the broad uh, ambition. But I think the main point is strategic prioritization has to take place across uh, it's beyond what SRSGs and SGs and, uh, and the Security Council can do. Uh, that was very much the purpose of setting off of the Peace Building Council. Hence, that's where we should you know, put our focus in the continued debates we will be having on this. Thank you very much, uh, Aspen Judy. Uh, a quick last comment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, good questions, but we don't have really time to, to go into it. Uh, but since I only have one comment to make, I just want to make an appeal. You know, this whole architecture is very much a hybrid kind of organization. You know, I'm 35 years in the UN system. I'm used to working in secretariat and funds and programs mm. where, except for the governing council, we pretty much can do, you know, in ACR, we did things for IDPs, you know, beyond refugees even, uh, and got away with it. <laughs> so uh, in this um, kind of situation, I must admit, I mean, I feel myself in a very awkward situation, and PBSO is in a very awkward position. On the one hand, we're dealing with a member state club that is you know, very clear in their minds that it's a member state club, and yet the secretariat entity that backstops them uh, has a responsibility to steer the bull a little, you know, maybe from behind a little bit, but steer the bull as opposed to letting the bull trample over you. So, um, so, I, uh, so I, I just want your understanding, that's all I'm saying, that we are always caught in this very difficult position between doing too much and not doing enough mm. because of the hybrid nature of the organization. Mm. And all I'm asking is for, for, to appeal to your understanding and to help us through this morass. That's all I'm saying. And I, obviously, Minister Eidig uh, is, is doing precisely that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that appeal. I think we all took careful um, notice of it. Uh, Marjan, quickly. 
Thank you. Just to address the last question, uh, the last comment that was made by the staff or former staff of, uh, of World Vision, uh, to say that uh, uh, the resource mobilization responsibility of the PBC is pretty much being addressed by the chair of the configuration. In our case, the, the Swedish ambassador who is, who is making some efforts. But I, I feel very much uh, that something could be done also on the ground. And that's where it comes. If, if World Vision is on the ground, if you can expand a little bit the responsibilities of the structure you do have uh, for coordination on the ground into doing some things that relate to resource mobilization among the, the actors on the ground, uh, that should also uh, be something that is that is acceptable. So that that is uh, what I would say. And also, I would pick up on the last point that was made by Elizabeth of the the, the peace building being a kind of platform on the ground that can broker certain things. But you have to have a little bit of, of visibility. And, and and I come again with strengthening that presence, whatever it is, that visibility. Uh, peace building, and then you can broker because indeed a lot of peace building funds go to the UN agencies, and they are implementing in the name of of, of the BBC. But uh, whether whether the attribution is there is a different story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osval, for being quick. Uh, I will now give the word to uh, Parfait. Parfait, sure. if you. Thank you, Atelier. Um, I, I, I like just to say that. Um, uh, we are still at the at the very beginning of of um, the life of an important institution. The PBC is still in its uh, infancy, and uh, we must all um, acknowledge that the baby has grown very big, and maybe too fast. And uh, but but is the, the baby is delivering, and, and 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 we need to do something to ensure that it does it. Um, um, a bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, strategic, setting strategic priorities, definitely. Uh, Minister, I cannot agree more with you. And, and uh, this is what we, 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 we call for, so the need for uh, ensuring that there is a common uh, purpose and a shared vision um, in the way as, um, as, as partners in the field uh, we, 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 we assist countries. But most importantly, um, PBC, peace building, is first and foremost a national responsibility. Unless there is a clear and strong national leadership, and I, I say it again, ownership um, in the field, there can be sustainable peace building effort and all the goodwill of partners will lead nowhere. Um, whether we need to have integrated missions um, everywhere, certainly not. Uh, um, and and it, was, it was already said, it's not a panacea, and, and certainly not um, um, a one-size-fits-all um, um, recipe. Uh, but where it is um, uh, seen to be, um, uh, um, um, I mean, effective, I think, yes, I must say. And when it is not possible, through developing a common uh, uh, vision um, and a shared purpose, we can use the presence of UN agency uh, uh, um, uh, building on each agency's comparative ad advantage and ensuring that we carry together a same strategic vision for in support of, of the country. Uh, I, I will stop there, but again, thank you, Minister. Uh, this has been um, a, a great opportunity to, to exchange. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And then famous last words to the chairman. Ranko, you have the floor. Thank you, Sugar, at the end. Very briefly, just two points. First of all, uh, this event, uh, in my opinion, clearly showed that there is really a need to, to uh, continue the discussion we have heard. Uh, many uh, observations which are very useful and we can build upon them. Uh, secondly, let's try to work on two tracks, first uh, strate strategically, and uh, I really uh, like the, the expression of strategic prioritization. I think that that's what it is about. And uh, so, uh, on the other hand, let's work short term here in New York, what we can do, uh, starting from our relationship with principal organs, starting from our ongoing uh, 
dialogue with the World Bank and other financial institutions and other parts and elements of the peace building architecture. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists for being um, so, as I've said several times, so candid and clear. And um, I'm also very grateful that uh, we've had so many spirited um, interventions, uh, particularly taking the early morning hour into account. So thanks to all the panelists, to the foreign minister, to all participants, and good luck to all of you who are working with peace building in the secretariat amongst member states and amongst NGOs who are present here. And to all, have a wonderful day. Thank you.